Let's get into this a little bit today. Let me tell you a little bit about, about my background. Um, at 18 years old, I married my bride, Amy. She was the one that was hopping up and down right here in the middle, uh, kind of singing her, her heart out, and God's spirit rests on her. God has really blessed me with an amazing wife. And uh, we got married at 18 years old. I remember we moved, went to Bible college in Springfield, Missouri, and the first thing that happened was we were looking for a church. And we were like, I need to learn how to be a children's pastor because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a children's pastor. And so I visited a couple churches, and at this one church, I met this guy named Brian. And he said, tell me your story. Tell me about you. Tell me what you're trying to do. I said, listen, man, I'm not going to church hop. I want to, like, find a church, and I will stay committed to this church for the next four years of my life if you will make a commitment to me that you'll teach me how to be a children's pastor. And he, for whatever reason, he just connected to me, and I connected to him, and he really liked me. And he said, well, listen, I'm looking for a children's pastor right now. Why don't you just be our children's pastor, and we'll hire you to do this job? And so I gave him what I thought was a good answer. It was a spiritual answer. I said, let me pray about it. Now, let me remind you some context. I've never lived on my own before. I'm a dumb, young, 18-year-old who doesn't have it figured out at all. Like, I can tell you stories, and you go, you were dumb. And I'd be like, mm-hmm, told you, right? Like, and I'm newly married. I'm now many hours away, 12, 13 hours away from all my family, all my wife's family. I have nothing but God and love, all right? And I'm in this new city, and I get this opportunity. And I, I remember I left. I said, I'm going to pray on it. I'll get back to you. I left there. I was pretty excited, though. I was like, this is a cool thing. And so I called my dad. I said, Dad, I said, listen to what happened. And he goes, well, what did you say? I said, well, I told him I'd pray on it. He goes, you're an idiot. He says, you don't have anything that you need. He says, Take the job. And then he hung up on me. That was the whole conversation. This is like five minutes after I left Brian's office. And so I called Brian on his cell phone. I said, hey. He goes, yeah, do you have another question? I said, no, I, I prayed about it. <laughs> and, and, and I think I'll take the job. And so funny enough, uh, we did the children's uh, pastor role there, learned how to do children's ministry. And, and God really did some incredible things there. Along the way, you don't know what you're doing, right? Let's just say what it is. I had no clue what I was doing, and God began to minister and work, and that church began to grow, and the children's ministry began to grow, and uh, then I graduated. I actually graduated early from Bible college because I did all the accelerated courses, any spring courses, summer courses, Thanksgiving courses, Christmas break courses. JJ, I see you over there smiling because I got him doing the same thing. I'm like, do all your work fast, right? Like, accelerate, get done, get done, get done, and so I did all all that and I graduated and then I ended up becoming a children's pastor at a church that had about 35 40 students that were sixth grade and down so birth through sixth grade and I remember they had a, a great facility lots of classrooms lots of space in there and I was like all right God I finally now get to like I'm not in school I get to fully dedicate myself to this help us. Like, what do we need to know? What do we need to do? And, and we were having so much fun with the kids. And week after week, God began to grow that ministry. And it was exciting, guys. Teaching, teaching kids is so much fun because they like, they like believe you when you talk about God's word. And adults tend to question everything. So it's like one of those things you tell them, they're like, yeah, Noah, man, we got to be like Noah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like, like this is what it is. So so we saw God really begin to work, and I remember we got to about 450 kids. It just kept growing and growing and growing. And we had used every single classroom that the church space had on campus. And I began to feel something in my heart like, okay, God, like, now what? What are we going to do? Like, the fire marshal isn't happy with us every single week that we meet. We cram a lot of kids into these rooms, and it was not right, and it was like, what are we going to do? And I remember um, my pastor saying, hey, we need a young adult ministry at our church. Would you start a young adult thing? Now, listen, I had no clue what I'm saying, no clue what I'm doing. You might as well ask me if I can lay carpet for you. I have no idea how to do what you're asking me to do. Sure, I'll do it, pastor. And so I stepped in. I was like, let's go. I said, what do we do? And he's like, you're going to meet. We had Sunday school. So this is a church Sunday school 
church, then Sunday night church, Wednesday church, Thursday Bible study, Saturday you come for an outreach and invitation. Um, you might have something else going on depending on what the events are, like tons of stuff going on, right? Like that was the kind of church. And so I remember they gave me this little room and, uh, and I was like, hey, um, I'm gonna call everybody that looks like they might be between the ages of 18 to 30. So I just started like looking around everywhere. And then it was like speed dating at church on Sundays. I'm like, hey, you look like you're the right age. You need to be a part of this. So I like going to everybody and recruiting everybody. Da, 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 da. So I'm like, we're going to have this big kickoff on this date. And we had this kickoff. And I remember being so pumped because the room had like 17 people in it, which was they never had anything before. I'm like, there's 17 daggone people in this room. God is blessing it. And, and I was so excited and I was looking forward to the next week. So I'm like, we're going to have like 25 the next week. And we successfully grew that down to seven. <laughs> and I learned one of my first ministry lessons that not everybody comes back. And I'm like, man, what happened? What I thought should have been a certain way didn't go the way that I thought that it was going to go. And I'm like, Lord, what's that about? And God was basically training me and teaching me and equipping me and helping me to learn things that I didn't know so that way I could handle a little bit more later on. Because if I would have just had what I wanted, we would have had like a thousand people in the room, like, boom, look, all this awesome. And he would have been like, yeah, and that would have swallowed you up, bro. So I'm protecting you by not giving you what you think you need or what you want right now so I can grow you up into it so that way you're ready for it when it's there and it doesn't kill you. There's a message in there for a lot of people in the room somewhere. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, in fact, today I was like, okay, this is a little different because I'm used to going through the life of Jesus. We've been in the book of Matthew. Now I'm going to be sharing our story. That's going to feel different than what we normally do. What are you saying, God? And, and I, hear me clearly. I'm not saying I'm like a Bible character or a, in the Bible in any way. What I'm saying is when I read the Bible, I see like Moses had an encounter with God where God tried to tell him something. And then you see like, how did Moses respond to what God was saying? And then we read about his story. And then we read about Noah and he has an encounter with God and does the same thing. And how does he respond? All I'm trying to communicate today is Amy and I have a story. We're not Bible characters, but we had an encounter with God. And we're hoping that by telling you our story today, it might resonate with you in some way where maybe you live at today. Or maybe there's something that you're praying about today and you're trying to figure out what your next step looks like. And we're hoping that this can bring encouragement to you and that you can see some of the twists and turns along the journey. And it might just help you in some way. So as we go through and we celebrate our birthday, I have a goal of the message. Goal of the message is to obey God even when the request is uncomfortable. Even when the request is uncomfortable. In fact, I would argue that the more uncomfortable the request, the higher amount of faith it's going to require for you to get the task done. And the good news about faith is the Bible says in Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we need to make sure we have faith in whatever equation we're working with. Otherwise, we're not pleasing God because it's not taking any faith to do it. Without faith, it's going to be impossible to obey God even when the request is uncomfortable. We need to be willing to let God move us to the uncomfortable spaces. So we're in this church. Children's ministry blew up. It was awesome. God began to work and move in young adult ministry, and he began to equip us and train us. And we saw that thing go to 30 people, and then 40, and then 50, and then 60, and 70, 80, 90. We got to about 92 people, and I started having a weird feeling. And it was weird because everything on paper in our life was really great. You know, um, I grew up very poor, so to have a roof over my head and to be able to pay my bills and to have food on my table was like a really big deal. And that's where we were. We had a roof over our head. I had a 1993 Honda Prelude that shouldn't have been running but I'm a tither, y'all. And that thing kept running and going and going and going and going. And I was just happy to have some transportation that got me from point A to point B. And I'm like, God, I know you did that one, right? So I was pretty comfortable with the situation that we had going on. And in fact, a lot of people in that church would come up and say, 
you know, Randy, if you'll just stick around here, we love everything you've done in children's ministry. We love everything you did in the young adult ministry. We want you to be the next pastor of this church. Just wait a couple of years. And you know what? That sounded pretty good. Because everything from that point had been like, go do what God said. He does a big, awesome thing. Go do what God said. He does a big, awesome thing. Just continue to do what God said. He's going to do an awesome thing. Sounded easy, comfortable, good. Let's just keep doing that plan. Almost to the point of don't mess with it in any way because we don't want to break it. Don't mess with it. But yet, even though everything on paper was right, something wasn't right in here. Now, if you're married, I don't know if your wife is the same as my wife, but let me talk about my wife. My wife knows me really, really, really well. I don't have to say anything. I don't have to do anything. And she goes, hey, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what do you mean what's wrong with me? She's like, I know something's going on in your head. And I'm like, stop, get out of my head, dude. Like, what are you doing? And she's like, no, 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 what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing's wrong. And so I, you know, I lied to her for three weeks or so, you know, like nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. She's finally like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I can't identify what's wrong. Something is wrong. I don't know what's wrong. And I've learned to put some description around that. I had what they call a holy discontent. It wasn't that I was mad at anybody or anybody did anything wrong to me. In fact, everything seemed right on paper. But there was a holy discontentment in me that said, maybe I don't want you to be here anymore doing this this way anymore. And I need you to be willing to do whatever I ask you to go do. Hmm. That made me uncomfortable. And then I would read my Bible because, you know, funny enough, being in ministry, I would read my Bible. Um, Genesis chapter 12, I, I come across this and I remember absorbing it. The Lord had said to Abram, he said, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Well, that's not very comforting. The land I'll show you, what does that even mean? Then he says, I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing to other people. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. And I would read that and be like, that's great for Abraham. But I'm doing all right where I'm at. And Amy said, well, you know, you really need to pray about what's going on here, why you feel the way that you feel. I'm like, oh, thanks, babe. You're right. Okay, I will. And then I kind of go on with my day. And then God threw some other scripture at me. Judges chapter 6 says this, the Israelites. The Israelites, by the way, were God's people. This was his army. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, in caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. And they camped on the land and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing <laughs> for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Which, by the way, if you're stuck and you're not sure what you're supposed to do, things aren't going really well, this is really good advice, to cry out to the Lord for help. And I, I call Amy my second Holy Spirit, because she reminds me, you gotta call out to God, what are you doing? And I'm like, you're right. And she convicts me and is like, you're not focusing there. And I'm like, you're right, you're right. And I cried out to God, I'm like, God, you're gonna have to show me what to do next. Now. Amy said these words, though. She said, you know, um, if you think that we're not supposed to be here, she's trying to ask, like, what do you think we're supposed to do? And she said, well, have you ever thought about starting a church? And I said, Amy. 
Amy, Amy. Good, young, old, beautiful. Young, old, beautiful Amy. <laughs> Wise and unlearned at the same time. <laughs> And I began to kind of lecture Amy, like, Amy, do you know what that would mean if we started a church? If we started a church, you know, we're probably going to go somewhere where we're going to be away from all of our family. And my kids are going to grow up, and they're not going to have their grandparents around. And look at all the little buddies they have right now. You know, by the way, my, my two oldest at the time, they were like one and three. I mean, they're like super young. I'm like, look at all the buddies that they have <laughs> as they sit in the little, you know, what is that called? Car seats. There it is. Sorry. <laughs> My kids are older now. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, look at all the buddies. They just hang out together, and we want them to have friends, and we want them to have this, and we don't want to lose all that. And if we go start a church, who knows where God would send us? There might be crazy people there. Well, that part of the story was true. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> so, so it's... So I'm like, babe, here's the thing. If you start a church, there's some things I know about church. Like, things about church that I just know have to happen is you need a building. We ain't got no building to meet in. How are you going to do church without a building? And she's like, well, you know, God. And I'm like, yeah, but, I'm trying to argue God. She throw God in the mix, right? And I'm like, but, but you also, you need people. And we ain't got no people there. If God send us somewhere, we're not going to know anybody. How are we going to do it? We're not going to have a building. We're not going to have any people. And she's like, well, the Lord would have to provide. And I'm like, yeah, but. I'm like, but, but the big one is we don't have any, any resources. We don't have any money to even do this plan. So how would we do it? And she's like, God's going to have to provide. I'm like, yeah, babe, but I don't think you understand what you're even saying. And she gave me one of these. She said, well, will you just go pray about it? And I'm like, ugh, killing me. And I said, of course I'll go pray about it. But I threw up one of the most half-hearted, you know, Jonah-type prayers. Like, like God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and talk to the people and tell them about the gospel. And he didn't want to do it. So he ended up running the opposite direction. So I'm like, God, if you want me to one of those. And I keep reading the story about Gideon and how Israel sinned and the Midianite camp was coming against them. They cried out to the Lord for help. Verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, so there's this encounter with God where God said, the Lord is with you. And he calls Gideon a mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, he said, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? He's like, I'm sending you to go do this thing. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Translation, I'm not qualified, and I'm too weak to go do what you've just told me that I can go do. You're calling me a mighty warrior, but I feel weak and unworthy. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe God's leading you a direction and you're scared and you're going, there ain't no way. I don't know how I would do that. Verse 36. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised. And he's about to do something here. I've never forgot this. I read this and I immediately applied this to my own situation. I was like, I need to apply this right now to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. Because, God, I'm throwing up these half-hearted prayers. I like that we have this young adult ministry that's growing. I like this church that I'm in. I like what's going on. What do you want to do? If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I'll place a wool fleece, a little, little rag, on the threshing floor. 
And if there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground around it is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. So you're like, well, God just showed him. But I love the Bible and the way it's written because certain stories in these characters, they're written specifically for you. Like, like, like Gideon's my kind of guy. You all have a Bible character that you relate to and you go, that's my character. Like, I, I get it. Gideon's my kind of guy because he goes, then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me just try one more time. Like clear as day, God did everything he said that he wanted to do in that first request. Let me give you one more request. Allow me one more test with this rag, with this fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground all around it be covered with dew. Because I'm pretty dumb. And I think it might have been a fluke. And I just need to be double verified that this is exactly what you want us to do. Anybody feel like you need double verification for things? Come on. Now, y'all are my people, all right? So we're working together here. We like Gideon because it's like, I need triple verification. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit needs to tell me, all right? That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. So I immediately thought, okay, I've gotta, I've gotta put the fleece down. This is my fleece prayer. We had 92 people in our young adult class. And and listen, if you're a metrics person or a numbers person or KPIs, key point indicator person, if you're that type of individual, we were tracking everything. So our metric looked like this. It looked like started with nothing, and then it went up, a little bit down, up, a little bit down, up, a little bit down, up, 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 and it looked good, like an earthquake, but in a good way. It's like God's moving. And I was like, okay, so, so we're looking at the metric, and every time we did a friend day, we'd have like 25, 30 new people that would come on friend day. Everybody would invite their friend, and, and I got 93, 92, 93 people, and I'm like, God, would you just, my fleece prayers, if you want me to stay here and do ministry in this place, then let us hit 100 people on friend day. Because I thought I need to lower that bar for God to just make sure he could hit it. (laughs) Crazy thinking. Now, again, I'm used to like 30 new guests going to come. We we could have, like in in God's uh, historical experiences that he had allowed us to see, man, we would have had 130, 140 people at church that day. So the day comes, and I'm excited, and then the people that are always at church. I'm talking about the Aiden and Jesses of the world that are always there. Keith and Melissa who are always sitting on the front row at church. Josh and Megan who are always here, sitting right there. I sat right over there and Josh said, hey, you're in my spot today. I died laughing. (laughs) I said, that is his spot. You know, like I'm in the wrong spot. It's funny. They're always at church. On that day, the people that, were always at church, couldn't come. There was people out of town, people had a vacation going on. Um, This one lady called me later, I'm like, what in the world? She called me, she said, my cat was throwing up, so I couldn't come to church. (laughs) Guys, I threw my do-rag down, my fleece prayer, and I'm like, come on, God, give us 100. You know how many people we had at church that day? 53. I don't know what I taught during that class. I, I managed my way through it somehow because I'm thinking we're going to have 125 people here. And I'm sitting here looking at now half of the room full. And I know that God has spoken loud and clear to me. You are not going to stay where you're at, son. And I'm like broken before the Lord. I remember I went to my pastor in between Sunday school and church. I said, hey, is there any way that I can come back to church tonight I've got something going on. I just, need to, I just need to go home. He said, sure, I'll see you tonight. So I, I leave, me and Amy get in the car. She's like, what's going on? I'm like, the fleece prayer. You know, like I'm going through the whole thing. She's like, what does this mean? I'm like, I don't know what this means. And you know what she said? Have you ever thought about starting a church? 
Couldn't get away from it. And I'm like, babe, crazy. Come back to church that Sunday night. I've never had this experience in the whole time we were in that church. We were in that church for about nine or ten years. That night, I come back to church, and they just so happen to have a church planner coming up to speak to the entire congregation about planning a church in the city. That had never happened. I only knew one other guy that was a church planner in, in the whole history of my brain. Like, I don't know of anybody else who's doing this. And <laughs> I remember I interviewed that guy. By the way, I just saw him two months ago. We sat around a campfire together reminiscing about this exact thing. And I said, I said, Ben, tell me how to start a church. And he looked at me and he goes, buddy, I don't know how to start a church either. He said, you're just going to have to obey God. And I'm like, ah, don't know what that means. How do I do that? I want to do it, but I don't know how to do it. So he goes, you need to figure out where God's sending you. And I remember we, we, uh, we left, went home. I said, Amy, look up five states that you want us to, to look up. I'll write down five states you want us to look up. We'll bring them together and we'll see if any of these even match. Number one on my list was Texas. Number one on her list was Texas. We were like, we have a starting point. Okay. So we started. She's a big researcher. She's looking at all the things. She's seeing all the things. And I'm just like, God, I don't care about any of those things. Just tell me where to go. I need to make sure it's right. You know? And, and I remember thinking, I only know one person in the whole state of Texas right now. Guess who I knew? A guy named Brian. The guy that hired me to be a children's pastor became a pastor in a church in Arlington. And I called him and I said, Brian Gray, I said, I haven't talked to you in several years now. And God's doing a big thing. And um, I'm thinking that I might need to start a church, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know where I'm going. I don't know anything. All I know is you're in Texas. And in my head, I'm thinking Texas is Walker, Texas Ranger. You all know what I'm saying? In my head, cowboys everywhere with horses. Like, y'all aren't even in cars. You just ride horses everywhere. I don't know. And I'm like, tumbleweeds in the background. Wear a toothpick everywhere you go. I don't know. I just, in my head, that was the image of this area. And I'm like, Brian, you're there and I'm not. Would I fit there? Because you know who I am. He goes, Randy, he says, let me tell you what just happened. He said, I'm in Dallas traffic. He said, I'm trying to get home. Traffic is super backed up. He says, I'm eating a soft pretzel, because this is Brian talks, this is the way he talks. I'm eating a soft pretzel. He said, I just got out of a pastor's meeting. 25 to 30 pastors came to this meeting today. And the whole focus was we need to start new churches across the state of Texas. He said, we stood in a circle and we began to pray for people to come because we have some financial resources that we want to help some churches get started, but we don't have any church planners that want to start churches. And he says, I'm literally going to get off the phone with you and make a call to the chairman of this thing and tell him that you've just called me. He's like, we need to get you down here. And I'm like, <laughs> I remember my wife was listening to his speakerphone and she starts crying and I'm just like, God, you're speaking. Like, I don't know anything more than like, yes, God, you're doing something. And it was one of the coolest experiences in all the world. It was like confirmation. When you heard somebody from the location saying this thing, it confirmed like, God, you're, you're moving me to this place. I've got to read you some more of this Bible stuff because we're here for the Bible, not for me. All right, so here we go. Early in the morning, Jerob Bill, that is Gideon. Everybody say Gideon. And all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Keep in mind Midianites, so many of them that um, it's like a swarm of locusts. So many of them can't even count all the, the big army that they're supposed to go against. And God looks at Gideon and says, you have too many men. If I take you in there and you destroy them, there will be some boasting and pride going on that says in your own strength you were able to accomplish this task. And I don't want anybody to get glory in this situation but me. So therefore, I'm going to thin out your army. Verse 3. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear... 
because again, that's a huge army we gotta go fight, and we're already outnumbered, they may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So, 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. That's a lot of dudes that just turned and walked the other way and said, I'm not gonna be a part. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. Thanks, God. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands. They went lapping like dogs, and the rest, they got down on their knees to drink. They just put their face right there in the water and started drinking the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So he's literally thinning this army down to 300 men. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. So they had a bunch of trumpets and a bunch of provisions. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura. Go visit the place and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Purah, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. And the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend a dream. I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. That's a crazy dream. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. In other words, the people that were in the land knew Gideon's going to come take us over. And yet Gideon has 300 dudes with him. He ain't got what he needs at all. And yet he has exactly what God told him he would need. He has everything you would need. When Gideon heard the dream and his interpretation, he bowed down and he worshiped. Guys, when Brian Gray told me they were praying for church planners to come, I bowed down and worshiped. And I thought, God, all right, I'm on the roller coaster. Click, 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 click. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianites camp into your hands. Oh, man. So I know, okay, I'm going to come down here. I visit the area. They take me to uh, Fort Worth. They take me to Trophy Club. They take me to Keller. I think that I'm going to land in the Keller area. I think that's where we're going to start a church. And visited it, and I'm like, all right, I know God wants me to start a church. I have no idea what I'm doing. Completely unqualified for everything that's coming ahead. Again, still have no people No money and no building. How are we going to do anything, right? No resources and provision that we think that we need. And I come home, and I'm like, all right, we're praying. I get a rando phone call from a guy named Brad Wilkerson. Brad Wilkerson, yeah, I love Brad, man. Brad's crazy, okay? So this guy calls me. I've never met him. Don't know who he is. He got my number from Brian Gray. Hey, dude, are you Randy Moore? I'm Randy Moore. You're not going to go plant a church over there in Fort Worth. Who is this guy? <laughs> Satan, is that you? You know, like, like what? Who is this guy? So I said, well, I'm not. He goes, no. He says, dude, you need to come back down here again. I said, I was just there like three days ago. He said, I've already talked to your pastor. I already booked a plane ticket. He said, I've already got a place for you to stay. I've got your food covered. I need you to come down here. I've got somewhere i got to show you. All right, man. And he took me down here. And it was funny because when you don't live in an area, you 
focus on the only thing you have, which is Google Maps, right? So we're looking at Google Maps, like the aerial view, and I remember seeing Custer Road up here, the dividing line between Frisco and McKinney, and I remember feeling like God's telling me that you need to go right there in between Frisco and McKinney. So you know where we live? Right off Custer Road, right there in between Frisco and McKinney. Because God told me you're going to go park yourself right there. And it's interesting because he told me, Brad took me around the area. I was like, this is it. There ain't no cowboys over here. I don't know where they're at. People look a little more not so country over in this part. Uh, All right, this is more more of my space. And so so I was like, all right, this is it. We're going to start a church here. I remember we moved down here and I got scared. We're two weeks in. We'd sold everything that we had. We got this little house and uh, we, we bought this place only because it had a big living room. That's the only reason why we bought it. It was like open floor plan. We were like, we need a place where we can do church inside of our house because we don't have any money, we don't have any people, and we got a building. We sold so much stuff that within the first couple of weeks, the uh, insurance company, I guess since, I didn't even know this, they sent an inspector out to like look at your property whenever you buy insurance. And uh, they looked in the window. We didn't have any blinds or curtains on the window, and they didn't see anything in the house, and they canceled my insurance. They said, you're not insurable. I said, what do you mean I'm not insurable? They said, well, you're just going to burn the property down and claim insurance on the house. I said, what makes you think I would do something like, just bought this house. Why would I do that? He goes, well, you don't have anything in there. I said, come back. So he comes back. I walk him upstairs, and I show him my bed. And they're like, We sold everything we have to move right here. This is all we own. Do you have anything you want to give us? (laughs) Literally what I said. Like, you can't cancel my insurance, dude. I need insurance on the house. So, so we, like, we didn't have anything. I remember having $4 in our church bank account. We have $4 in our church bank account. I remember I invited some of these guys, Brian Gray, and introduced me some pastors. He invited them over to, uh, to see what we were doing. Here's how we started. We started with a, uh, we moved in January, and I knew I was moving to football country. That the people around here like football. If you know me now, you know I can't stand football. I don't like football at all. I love basketball. I know that'll get me booed out of the place, but but I'm a basketball fan. I like Luca and Kyrie. I love the Mavs. Let's go Mavs, right? But but I don't know football. But I'm like God. I'm here to start a church, and I need to meet some people. So we're going to do a Super Bowl party. So February was coming up, and I went door to door, and we had the worst flyers that you'd ever seen. And I knocked on every door in my neighborhood and I said, guys, I'm brand new to the area. I just moved down to this house down the street, doing a Super Bowl party. If you want to come, I'm just looking to meet some more people around here. I remember the day of the Super Bowl comes. It's almost like 4.30, 5 p.m. And I remember we finally bought blinds because I didn't want the inspector coming back, right? I remember looking out the blinds and like seeing people walk by and I'm like, are they going to be the first people to ever come into anything that we've ever done ever? And they would walk by, <laughs> people walking their dog, right? But then all of a sudden, somebody knocked on the door. And I remember opening the door. I'm like, welcoming men. And you guys, we didn't have any money. We had like some chips and some like cans of soda and it, like a couple TVs set up. We're like, welcome. Yeah, good to meet you. So I'm introducing. And then some more people came. And some more people came. Some more people came. That day we had 27 people show up for the Super Bowl party. And as people would come, they'd go, introduce me to people. And I'm like, bro, I don't know any of these people. (laughs) What do you mean you don't know these people? I said, I know. Just like I invited you, I invited them. We don't know any of these people. It's all neighborhood people. I don't know. I don't know. So we're all in this place. And I remember um, we had bought these books. And I I had a friend that came and saw what we were doing. And uh, when he came and visited, he started crying. And I was like, dude, why are you crying? This guy's like 40 years old. He's crying. He's sobbing. He says, I cannot believe, because he's in my living room, and guys, we don't have a couch, we don't have a dining table, we don't have anything. When I say that I have an open floor plan, I mean, we can play tag in there, and it's awesome. <laughs> like, it's amazing. He starts crying, he goes, he goes, dude, I feel so bad. He said, you sold everything that you have to come to this place. He's like, I'm going to get you furniture. You know, the next day, that guy came back. He lives in Granbury. Him and like four other of his buddies came back with a trailer load of all sorts of just mismatched pieces of anything they could find that was literally, he went out to, he he, he went out to his car. I'll never forget this. He went out to his car. He'd been crying. Man, I might cry. I didn't plan on doing that. 
Oh, gosh, crap. Lonnie Learman is his name. <laughs> Lonnie, if you're watching. Oh. He went out. He had brought three guys with him that were on staff. And he was crying in my living room. He said, I can't believe you did all this. I said, dude, I don't, I'm just here. And he, he told me this story later. He goes out in my driveway. And he looks at those guys. And he says, give me all the money that you have on you right now. <laughs> They had like 300 and some dollars and some change on them. And he came in and he gave it to me. And I start crying. And I said, I only have $4 to my name right now. And I said, this is all we had. And I took that $343 and I remember we bought books with it. How stupid are we? <laughs> oh, I bought some books with it. And uh, it was a book called Crazy Love. And I remember I had my wife use her beautiful penmanship and write in the back of the book. And it was a message, um, just said, thank you so much for coming to our Super Bowl party. I hope that you'll read one chapter of this book and come to the 608. The 608 was a program that we had offered that was on Thursday nights. I'm from the hood, y'all. If you call something the 608, we show up, yo. It's like, <laughs> the 608's cool. All right, so we thought we were cool. We are like, Come to the 608 on Thursday nights at 6.08 p.m. We're going to read one chapter of this book, and we want you, you don't have to believe anything that's in here. Just want to know if you'll come and be a part with us. And we passed that book out with that $343 that they gave us. And we gave them to every single one. We had just enough, too. It was amazing. It's like exactly what we would need. And out of the 27 people, we had like 15 people that came back on Thursday. And out of those 15 people... Uh, one of them was an atheist, and it was amazing. The first thing this person says, we don't know each other still. We just watched a football game kind of together, right? Like gave them a book, and they came back. And uh, this lady goes, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I read the first chapter of this book. Didn't like it. Didn't agree with it. Goes on and on and on. And it's like, she says the whole thing. I'm like, thanks for coming tonight. So glad that you're a part. We we'll just keep reading the book until we get to the end. Do you know that that atheist was the first person that ever became a believer in our church? <laughs> Along the way, we had six or, seven other, uh, six or seven other people that got saved along the way and needed to be baptized. Guess whose church we went to? We went to Brad's church. Guess where he met? He didn't even have a building. He was in a school. So we went to a school and we, we baptized these six or seven people that had got saved in our ministry. And, and I remember uh, we had finally got to about 30, 30, maybe 35 people and Easter was around the corner. Now we're like April, April-ish. And we had, again, you don't got a lot. You take what you have. And I took what I had, and I said, Lord, I said, would you bless this? And we, we bought some hamburgers and hot dogs, and we passed out some flyers, and we said, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. We had 200 eggs. I know they do like 50,000 eggs Easter egg hunt. We were like, we have a 200 egg Easter egg hunt coming. Like, and we thought that was awesome. You know, like, that's all we have, but it is what it is. So we did this, went and passed those out. And I remember all week long, people were messaging me and saying, Pastor, unfortunately, it's supposed to rain on Saturday. And I know you want to do this event in the park, but it's going to rain. The day before, it's forecast to rain so bad. I'm like, what are we going to do, Pastor? I said, just show up. So I said, meet me there. So, so we have this little van. We load up some sound equipment and some things. We're going to have some music in the park. We're going to take these eggs out there. We're going to grill out. We got all these plans. We're going to do this thing. And I remember waking up, and it's like raining. I said, just meet me there. We got the stuff. I said, we're, we're now, we're, we got umbrellas. It's raining on us. And I said, grab the stuff that's not stuff that can get destroyed and carry it up first. We carried that up first. Then we come back to the van. And in the van, we got all our sound equipment, our speakers, everything that can get destroyed. And I said, guys, I said, before we go grab that stuff, I said, let's pray. We stood in a circle. There's about 12 of us. By the way, I have the names of these people. If you want to reach out to them, ask them if this story is true. You can ask them if this story is true. Okay? We're in a circle, and I start praying. 
I said, God, none of this is going to work if you don't show up. But God, you called me here. You told me to come to this place. And I don't have a lot. So God, I need you right now to make the rain stop. I need it to stop raining. And I need it to stop raining until I do this whole event. And a whole bunch of people can come and experience what we got going on here. And then God, if you want to make it rain the rest of the week, the rest of the month, the rest of the year, you can do whatever you need to do. But God, right now, I'm asking you to make the rain stop. And I prayed my guts out. And let me just tell you, when I stopped praying, it stopped raining. And I looked at my guys. I said, let's carry the sound equipment up. Now, we carried the sound equipment up. Now, they still, even though it stopped raining, they ain't got no faith, right? They're like, but pastor, what if it starts raining again? I'm like, set it up, dude. They set up the stands. They put the speakers up. I mean, it, there's no ceiling here, right? Like, and guys, that day the sun came back out. And about 200 people showed up to our event in the park. And we announced, hey, we're going to start a church, and we're looking for people to partner with us to make a difference in this city. God has sent us here. Here's who I am. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what God's told me. And guys, we did that event. It was amazing. And guess what? We packed all that stuff up, and as soon as we put that sound equipment into that van, guess what happened? It started raining. It was amazing. What is God asking you to do? Here's some possible next steps, and I'm going to just blaze through them. But here's what I know. We can't experience the blessing of God if we're not willing to do what he said. I tell my kids all the time, if I tell you to do your homework and you don't do it, don't ask me to go to the park and play. Don't, if I tell you to, to clean the house or, or make sure your homework's done or whatever I'm telling you, don't act like, hey, I'm going to reward you if you're not doing the things that I've asked you to do. If you do what you're supposed to do, wouldn't you be rewarded anyways? Well, yeah, we would be more naturally more inclined to do that. God is no different, y'all. We are his children. And when his children go out of line, he ain't going to bless you. But if you do the things that you're supposed to do and obey him, you can be blessed. And I want you to experience that. Here's some possible next steps. If you become a follower of Jesus, maybe you need to take your next step and get baptized. We're going to be baptizing today right after this service. We baptize uh, once a month uh, typically, but sometimes a lot of people need to get baptized, and we do it all the, every week. So it just is one of the things, right? Um, but if you need to get baptized, you need to get baptized. Take that next step. Take the plunge. Maybe you need to take a next step to join a serve team. We're all called to be on mission. We partner together for the kingdom to be built. We're building something special here in McKinney, Texas through what God's doing in this ministry. But you need to play a part of it. Don't just sit in the seat. Get in the game. You get in the game by going to the New Here Start Here class. It's every single week they meet during the second service. If you haven't gone yet, go next Sunday. Plan to go. Meet Desiree up there, and she'll tell you all the different areas where you can help in the church and begin to make a difference. Here's the next step. Learn to pray out loud. We've got to grow in our faith. Learning to pray out loud is important. We shouldn't be ashamed to pray to God. He's not ashamed of us. Why are we ashamed of him? I want to encourage you. Take a next step. Learn to pray out loud. Read a daily devotional. Read a daily devotional. Get God's word in your heart. Don't just come and hear what I'm going to tell you on once a week on Sunday. Eat spiritual food every day. You're going to be malnourished if you don't consume more of God's word. You can do that through that free app. Okay? Possible next step, worship and not care what people think. Got to learn to do that. We don't worry about what people think. Let me show you a picture of this in action. This was Isaiah, our keyboard player, on our worship night. Now keep in mind, the worship team is playing worship music. He's supposed to be playing the keys. He don't care what anybody thinks. He stopped playing the keys, got down on his knees like, I got to worship God right now. For whatever reason, he's like, I can't worship the way I need to right here. I'm going to worship right here on my knees. He don't care what anybody thinks. That's, that's alignment to the heart of Christ. Lead a small group, y'all. Make some relationships with other people that are Christians here. Learn, and if they're not Christians, teach them how to become a Christian. Take whatever God has shown you and give it to somebody else. This isn't about learn the whole Bible and then teach somebody something. This isn't learn the whole book of the Bible and then teach them something. This is take whatever God's done in you and give it to somebody else. Some of the curriculums I do, I don't even do the uh, curriculum before I get to the class. 
I do the class work with the people. We all just study it together. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you have a reputable teacher. And I can give you a list of names where we go. These are reputable teachers that, some of these are just DVD-based courses, and they do a great job giving you good material. But somebody's got to lead and coordinate the group. And maybe that's the next step for you. We got our small group interest meeting coming up. It's on Saturday the 27th at 10 a.m. If you want to lead a group, meet us Saturday at 10 a.m. or the 28th is a Sunday after the third service. We'll also have an interest meeting. So summer small groups, we're going to start organizing them. Maybe that's a next step for you. Here's a possible next step. Give sacrificially. Give sacrificially. Can I show you something? Can I show you something? Yeah. I'm talking to like a bunch of people and like two people respond. That's weird. <laughs> okay. Can I show you something? Yeah. All right. That was last Sunday in one of our services. Can I show you this? This is a different service. God is building this house. But I, here's the deal. I have a, a request. I have to request that you give sacrificially for the next step. Because the only reason we're here is because I remember, and this couple right over here, Faith and Robert sitting on the front row, they've been with me for 10 years. They were here from the very beginning, launch day. They've walked the whole road with us. That roller coaster, they've seen so much crazy stuff happen at Revolution Church. And I can't tell you how much their loyalty has meant to me. That loyalty is such a big deal, man. Such a big deal. I love you guys. Appreciate you guys. But they remember the days when we were in a school. And they remember the days when we were in a little storefront building. And we were saying, guys, we need to give so we can get this building because there's a whole bunch of people that we don't know who they are yet that need to come to Revolution Church and be a part of what we're doing. And now we're not in one service, we're not in two, we're in three. And guess what? God has a next step for us. It's, everything you're experiencing here is built on the back of somebody else who gave. We have to expand. We have to keep going. The story's not done yet. It's not finished being written. There's a next chapter that needs to happen. And here's what it looks like. Here's where the big ask is. I'm looking for 1,000 people to give $1,000 to this ministry. It's a lot of people, and that's a lot of money. But I want to process this out for a second. Okay, I don't want that to be intimidating. It, it's probably a leap of faith. It's probably going to be something you're like, well, that'd be hard to do, Pastor. I know. And I think God wants us to do it. You pray on it, and if he tells you to do it, then do it. You pray on it. He may tell you to do triple that, 10 times that. I don't know what he's going to tell you. You pray on it. Whatever he tells you to do, you should do. But let me tell you, we got to raise a million dollars. That's what that is. That's 1,000 people at $1,000 would be a million dollars. We could take a next step and reach more people in our city if we had a better venue, bigger venue, bigger opportunity. Say, so we really need that? We really do. We really do. We want to reach more people. Let's go. Let's grow. Let's grow, right? Let's go. Let's grow. Listen, process this $1,000 for a second. This is, maybe you go, I don't have $1,000 that I can give like that. Well, think of it like over the course of the next 10 months, would you give $100 a month? That's $1,000 that I'm asking you to give. Over the course of the next 10 months, as we round out this year, think through, okay, that's $25 a week. That's essentially, will you not go to Starbucks twice? And you'd have the $25 that you need. And here's what you could do. You could build a worship space for a whole bunch of people to come to and experience the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there may be food in his house. Here's what else you'll do. When you're driving down this this road, Virginia here, in about 15 years, you're going to look and you're going to say, see that place right there? And all your kids are going to look out the window and you're going to say, that wasn't there before. But we were part of a ministry and here's what we were doing at the time. And here's what we saw God do. And Faith and Robert have a story. They go, man, they were in a school and then we were there and then we we're here and they're still on the journey with us. They're just going to the next space. It's the next ride and it's exciting to see what happens. But you'll be able to say, we've built something that matters. Because you're investing money everywhere else. I'm investing in, invest in something that actually matters. <laughs> Let me give you the back end of this story. It's so good. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, so 100, 100, 100, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. 
Imagine you're about to go fight that big old enemy. They've got the real weapons, and you've got... And an empty jar. What? And Gideon says, watch me. He told them, follow my lead. Here's what I hope you see today. Today, I hope you watch me. I'm going to give the $1,000. I'm actually going to give more than that. I'm going to sacrificially give towards this mission because I want to see us take the next step. Watch me and follow my lead. I hope you'll do that. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, I want you to blow yours and shout. Shout this, for the Lord and for Gideon. Say it with me. For the Lord and for Gideon. He said shout it, so let's shout it. For the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 19, Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets, and they broke their jars, smash, that were in their hands. The three companies then blew the trumpets. Everybody blow your trumpet. Ready? And they smashed their jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets that they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. So they're ching, 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 ching. They're fighting themselves, and they don't even realize it. The army fled, and they pursued. The Israelites pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Bara. All the men of Ephraim were called out and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Bara. Church, for the Lord and for Revolution Church. Can I get you to say it with me? Let's try it. For the Lord and for Revolution Church. Can we shout it out? For the Lord and Revolution Church. We need a thousand people to give a thousand dollars. We're gonna raise a million dollars so we can stink and break ground on this campus and we can reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you wanna partner with us, you can give. But I'm gonna ask you the goal of this message really is to obey God even when the request is uncomfortable. Because here's what I know. I wouldn't know you and you wouldn't even know me right now if I would let fear take over. I remember at one point I was sitting on 380 and I got that feeling, God, nobody knows why I'm here. God, maybe I just made the biggest mistake of my life. And God, he said, as long as I am with you, you have everything that you need. Just trust in me and continue to do what I'm telling you to do. And I've been shouting out a battle cry, just like for the Lord. It's for the Lord and for Revolution Church, for the Lord and for McKinney, for the Lord and for Plano, for the Lord and for Frisco, for the Lord and for Prosper and for Allen, for Princeton. I'm asking you, will you partner with us for the Lord and Revolution Church to make a difference? It's a big deal, y'all to obey God, even when the request is uncomfortable. There was one verse that God gave me as I got through that fear mode, and it was so impactful, I wanna give it to you. It's found in Matthew, it says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. And that verse settled in my heart as I downloaded. I say, God, I'll go anywhere you tell me to go. I'll do anything you tell me to do. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if I lose friends over it. I don't care if people make fun of me about it. They did made fun of Noah too. And it still rained. God, you saved his family. God, be with me and be with my family. Walk with me. Lead me along the way. Help me along the way. And sometimes he gives us a trumpet. Sometimes just an empty jar. Sometimes you got $4 and you're going, God, how will we ever do it? And he goes, I'm walking with you. You have everything that you need. Just be obedient. Follow my lead. 
do as I do and watch what can happen next. I came here to McKinney, Texas because I want people to know how to get to heaven. I don't want you to die and be separated from God. I want you to know who God is and I want you to know that he loves you. The Bible says that if we call on his name, we can have his salvation. We can go to heaven. If you want to pray and ask God to be a part of your life, repeat after me. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's welcome people into the family of God, church. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we'd love to know. Text the word new me with no spaces to the number on the screen and we'll celebrate what God is doing. As we get ready to leave today, uh, I want you to get your first time, second time, or one month guest swag. If you go to the guest connect table right here on the left, tell them that you're a first time guest and they'll put this in your hand. Uh, I also want to encourage you to take what we call the stick six challenge. It's hard to get to know people in just one or two visits. Uh, but if you'll take the Stick 6 Challenge, we can get a better picture of who we all are together at Revolution Church. Lots of people are making their way out, and you're going, why is everybody leaving? Well, we have baptisms going on right now. So follow us on out there as we go and celebrate baptisms with some people. Let's go.